Hey everyone, how's it going? They already started my clock, so I'm just gonna start too. So we got a uh, talk today about CBC Casper design philosophy. It's mostly really about design methodology. Um, and I'm gonna walk you through some of the stuff that goes on in CBC Casper land in terms of the methodology that we use to develop and define distributed systems protocols. I'm gonna talk about it First is like what is described by construction, and then I'm going to talk about domain theory, and then like this kind of definedness stuff. It's going to be kind of a trip. It's going to be pretty cool, and then I'll talk and I'll give some examples of like actual CBC design in CBC Casper and some of the you know stuff that happens, and to give you kind of a taste of the methodology and the um, you know, like the, the the kind of approach that we have that kind of sets apart CBC Casper from, you know, other consensus protocol research. Um, and finally, you know, the last bit of my talk, I'll just do, I'll remind you all that where the resources are, show you some new resources and um, make some announcements. So let's talk about design methods in CBC Casper. The number one kind of like design methodology in CBC Casper is the correct by construction design, a protocol design methodology. The idea with correct by construction is that like the process by which you decide what program you write should guarantee that that program has the properties that you want. Like the very process that you use to specify the protocol should guarantee that the protocol has the properties that you want. So somehow, like, the way you decide what, like, formats to use or what, like, the protocol is in terms of, like, the data and the behavior, um, you know, that happens somehow. Like, definitions don't come out of nowhere. And there's, like, a process by which stuff gets defined. And it's called, you know, your process is called correct by construction. If, um, you know, the process that you use to define the thing somehow is guarantees that the definition that comes out is correct. This is kind of as opposed to the trial and error approach where you will like try something and then analyze it and then you might, it might work, it might not, and you'll maybe get lucky and, maybe, and if not, then maybe you'll learn something and just keep trying until maybe you'll find something. So this is a very different approach, right? Because instead of, like we never really have the trial and error, we just have like a lot of time defining stuff and then like once the definition pops out, it's like correct by construction and so there's no like, error, but in some way, like, you know, it takes us a lot longer to come out with a full definition. But when it, when it pops out, you know, we know it's correct by construction, uh, and we don't worry at all about m mistakes in the specification in the same way. Um, so there's two basically kinds of correct by construction software design that I'm kind of aware of. One of them is, you know, you, uh, you, you, you define like a, a proof maybe a type system and some proofs over a broad class of protocols or a broad class of programs. And then you, in your design process, choose your protocol, your, your protocol to be part of that set so that you know when you choose it that it's going to satisfy the theorem that um, you know, is, 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 is inhabited by this much broader set of protocols. So if we have like a, you know, a family of protocols, they all satisfy a theorem, and we like pick protocols or construct them in a way to guarantee that it's part of the family, then we can, in a correct by construction way, get a protocol that s has that property that you know, the theorem shows for the family. And then the other kind of approach is that um, the protocols are specified in a way that actually generates a proof of their correctness. So you, know, the, you generate the protocol and a proof, like a new proof for every protocol. Um, and, and I don't do any of that. Um, uh, it sounds hard, and I've, I've heard people doing it in like programming languages and compilers, but it hasn't showed up for me yet. So what, we, what I do here is basically we, we, what we do is we define large families of protocols, and we prove things about them, um, and then we and then we and then we choose specific protocols out of them, uh, which will. They're, by virtue of being in, in those families, have these properties. So now we're going to switch over to this very related topic, um, but like going off into the math deep end. So domain theory is a field of mathematics that studies, um, it's, you know, a, it studies the semantics of programming languages. Um, but it really, the reason why it's super interesting to me and to the, to, it, to just 
and why it's really useful for understanding the correct by construction process is because it provides us a language for talking about partial definitions, you know, incomplete definitions, partial protocol specifications, um, and, and, and we can um, understand what it means to have a process of defining something as opposed to just having something that's outright fully defined as you might have in set theory. Um, so like, you know, you should think of domain theory as something that arose out of people's um, feelings that set theory was inadequate for dealing with programs and the semantics of programs, especially recursive programs and like a lazy evaluation. Mm, but I'm not, I'm not an expert in domain theory, but there are some things that I've learned from domain theory that I find super useful for thinking about a bunch of stuff, including correct by construction protocol design. So there's a really, really, you know, kind of core notation in, in domain theory to use this, like, uh, and to define this thing called undefined. So this bottom notation means undefined. And it's like defined to be the most undefined thing. It is the most undefined thing in this partial order of definedness. It's like, if, if, I, if I say nothing about my protocol, then like I have, I've, I've like left it completely undefined. Um, and, that, and somehow that's like the most undefined that I could leave it. And as soon as I say stuff, I, it becomes more defined. Uh, and we could talk about and reason formally about this order of definedness and this process of defining stuff and you know, having at certain stages a partial definition uh, and then getting in more and more, more, and more um, defined protocols. So if A is a definition that can be reached from a definition B by replacing an undefined term in B with something that's defined or something else, then A is, gonna be, is more defined than B. So basically, like, if I have a definition, it's got some undefined term in it, and I can replace it to get some other definition, then that other definition is more defined than this like, initial definition. So I'm going to give some examples. So here we go, you know, bottom times bottom is more defined than bottom because you can replace bottom with bottom times bottom and therefore, um, you know, you can d define something which is completely undefined bottom to be this thing bottom times bottom which is still not totally defined but it's more defined than just bottom. Uh, you know, bottom times empty set is more defined than bottom times bottom because you can replace bottom with uh, empty set and get from bottom times bottom to bottom times empty set. What about empty set times bottom versus bottom bottom? Well, you know, you can place the first bottom with an empty set and so the thing on the left is more defined than the thing on the right. But the next example is a little trickier because it's not more defined than the thing on the left. Sorry. The empty set times bottom is not more defined than empty set times bottom. Um, bottom times empty set because you can't replace the bottom to get empty set times bottom because there's already an empty set in that position. So, you know, basically what, it, what we're doing is we're placing the bottoms on the right to see if we can get the thing on the left. And if we can't, then it's not more defined then. And if, it, if we can, then it is more defined then. So at the end of the day, what we kind of get is this picture, this partial order of the definedness of these terms. So like bottom is the most undefined. Bottom times bottom is a little more defined. These two terms, the left and right, they're not more defined than each other, even though they have a term that is in common, I mean, a term that it, it, both of them can define. Um, that, you know, a, a term that inhabits both of these partial definitions. And so kind of, you know, what we do in the correct by construction process is we move from less defined protocol speci specifications to more defined protocol specifications. We have um, a, a, a kind of process of we say something about the protocol, then we prove things about the protocol, so that later when we continue to define the protocol, the things that we proved continue to hold because all of the later definitions are just a, they're just a refinement of the previous definition. And, you know, so, you know, so the, the kind of um, theorems that we have for less defined versions of the protocol spec are going to hold for more defined versions of the spec. And this kind of starts to make you feel why we have like this correct by construction protocol design because at some point we're going to have a partial spec and some proofs. And then there's no way for us to define that spec more that will kill those proofs. Um, so basically, like our kind of strategy is to like deliberately give and prove, give 
partial specifications and prove things about partial specifications so that we can have a lot of flexibility in our iteration and design because we can continue to define from that point in many different directions without having to worry and go back about um, you know, verifying and changing proofs that, um, you know, because of the change in the protocol. So like a lot of the time when you have a protocol and you make a change, you're gonna have to like change the proofs that you have about the protocol. But if you instead had some partial definition of the protocol that you had some proofs from, which you could change, and, and you can make your change to your protocol by just read, uh, continuing to define the protocol just like in a different way from before, then you can, you know, not have this additional proof obligation uh, because you just have proven it for a much broader class of things, which are kind of the things that inhabit this less well-specified definition of the protocol. So let's, uh, so, so, you know, I, th I think we can get a lot of um, flexibility in design and, uh, because, we, be, because, of this, um, because of this approach. And so here's um, some actual like partial order of definedness in like some definitions that we have in the Casp CBC Casper world. So we have this um, minimal CBC Casper family of protocols, um, which is like the specification that's like the easiest to understand, the smallest, the few, fewest parts. Um, and we define terms in that specification to define like the binary consensus protocol, the blockchain consensus protocol, um, and other consensus protocols that you've seen if you've watched me present on CBC Casper over the years. Um, and so all of these protocols, these three protocols, the binary consensus protocol, the integer, and the friendly ghost, they're all more defined than the minimal CBC Casper specification. And they all satisfy the same proof as the minimal CBC Casper spec. And the, these, these all um, therefore, we, we kind of benefit from that proof, and we don't need to look back much when, we, when, we, when, when we're defining forward from this minimal CBC Casper family. We don't need to look back and ask about whether that proof will continue to be satisfied. But you know, this, this, this family of protocols actually has um, a full node condition. It requires that all the messages, all the nodes process all the justifications of all their messages. And so that's actually not super useful, for example, for sharding. And so it, we don't actually want to have de defined sharding as a further definition of this specification because it's a full, it requires this full node condition. And so actually what we do instead is we have like this other spec, which is like this light client spec, um, which, you know, where clients don't need to have all of the, just all of the, resolve all the pointers and all their messages. And so we, and, and we define the sharded blockchain consensus protocol spec as an instance of this like, CBC, like client CBC family of protocols, which all satisfy the same consensus safety proof. And actually there's like a more abstract uh, family of protocols, which is, you know, considerably harder to communicate than the minimal one, but which is less defined than both the light client protocol and the minimal CBC Casper protocol. And so like if we, with, with this kind of setup, what, we can, what, what this does is it gives us a, a, um, a, a like little, little roadmap of like starting from where, like what is defined and what properties do you have, and if you go downstream from there and continue to find stuff, you know, what, what, what do you get to benefit from? And so it, it can be really, um, you know, I, so, I th so I think this kind of notion of a def order of definedness and of progressively giving more and more defined protocol specifications um, is very, 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 very much what we're doing in correct by construction protocol design um, because we're engaged in the process of defining something and at, we, when, at the start we don't have a full definition. But we want to get to a point where we do have a definition that satisfies certain properties. And we want to know that the process that which we follow will guarantee that we have those properties. Uh, and so, you know, we, tr we, we, we try to have this kind of a, a disciplined approach for getting them one step at a time in a way where we don't really have to look back so, um, but you know, it's not always as straightforward. Sometimes we have like alternative choices of what, how exactly to define stuff and even to get the same goal. So it's, you know, I painted a pretty simple picture, but the reality is more complex. For example, for validated rotation, the easy thing to do in terms of the protocol specification and the proof obligations is to just launch lots of instances of these protocols that have new validator sets. And that really can work in some cases. 
But there are also cases where we want to define protocols that do validate a rotation in a way that is outside of the minimal CBC Casper framework. Um, and whenever we do this kind of design that's outside of the, of the framework, we, need to, we create new proof obligations. And so uh, we, we sometimes have to have a choice between, you know, do we, do we design things in a way to take advantage of existing proofs? Or do we come up with a new system or a broader family that, uh, that have other proofs? And it's, it, it, it's, it's tricky because like, on the one hand, we want to benefit from all the proofs we already have and we don't want to make any new ones. On the other hand, um, when, we have, when we can generalize stuff, sometimes we can generalize it a, like, a bit and not as much as we'd like. And so if I come up with a more general family of protocols for doing validator rotation, for example, like I haven't come up with one that really does everything I want. And so there's, 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 there's definitely, it definitely isn't as simple as like, you know, define as you go and everything will be fine. Uh, there's real choices that we need to make uh, and like in the design process. So one of the decisions we've made, for example, is that uh, val validator strategies are not part of the specification. Um, I would like the core core, like the, you know, the core partial spec. Uh, is only for clients. It's like not the spec for miners or for people who make messages, it's people for people who receive them. Um, and, the, and the reason why we did this is because it's like kind of, um, it, it, it separates out the, the parts of the protocol in a way that allows us to tackle them separately. And we can like, independent of when validators make messages or of how validators make messages, show consensus safety. So we have this big part of this, the protocol of like when do nodes make messages, which is not defined in the core spec, which both seems weird because you'd expect that to be part of the consensus protocol, but also is really nice because there's nothing that, there's no way that that term could be defined in a way that disrupts the proofs in the, uh, for, 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 for the like client protocol. And so validator strategies are not in the core, the core partial protocol spec. And, I, and that was like one of the decisions we made, and def, I definitely don't regret it at all. Um, we have a bunch of design decisions that are motivated by economic thinking, but also at the same time we leave incentives undefined until very late in the game because the incentives have to respond to the actual states of the protocol uh, and, the, actual, and, and the, you know, the consensus protocol itself, and so you can't actually define the incentives until the consensus protocol is defined. And so although we do a lot of thinking, economic thinking up front and we come up with a lot of distributed systems properties that we want based on the economic thinking, the, um, and the, 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 the definition is of the incentives is left for later. So, you know, we have um, the, the fault tolerance threshold is not specified in the protocol. It's like a decision we made and like, very, like, you know, like it was not an arbitrary decision and was, it was, like, was motivated by like the design requirements that we have. Um, and we have, and, 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 and this is like an area where um, it's not in the core reference spec, but we have a proof for how nodes use, would use it with different fault tolerance thresholds. And so we can, without changing the core spec very much, give proofs for a new kind of use of the protocol. So, you know, more kind of weird proof tactics around, you know, um, using multiple instances of this, like, correct by construction, core protocol, partial spec. You know, we have preventing DOS will require, like, you know, that we bound the amount of work required to process a message and that people have throttling for the uh, amount of messages that they can receive. And so that, is, that's good. that requires a new constraint on consensus messages. It requires new strategies for the validators. None of this stuff is part of the core protocol spec. None of it is part of the minimal, you know, core piece of the, like, you know, the, 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 of, 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 like, the start of the correct by construction process. And all of that is kind of very deliberate uh, because the idea is that we can define this stuff later. And it's more than fine. Uh, because we didn't screw it up by defining it earlier. So, so uh, the, 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 the other kind of, um, th you know, really cool thing about the correct by construction approach is the fact that you can iterate actually quite quickly um, without having, because you don't have to reason about much of the protocol when you make changes, because you, you 
literally could not define it in a way that screws it up. And so we ha I'm going to show you some of the progress we've made in the last little, little few months on some of the sharding stuff. So this is um, what came out of uh, the ETH Berlin hackathon. We came up with like a pair of shards, one of which kind of follows the other one. It's, 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 very, it's very similar to the traditional CBC Casper consensus protocol in the sense that like it's, you know, it's, it's really implemented at, like, in completely as just a definition, in the, a further definition of that protocol by giving the consensus values and the estimators and the validators and their weights and the fault tolerance threshold. Um, so, so, so we did this binary, so we, so we did this two, two shard system. And one thing that we kind of have been wanting to do for a while that uh, finally kind of got to implementing is, uh, you know, in, in just like a few months, uh, like a really short order, uh, is shard rotation. So like here what we see is two shards that are changing position. Um, one of them is the root at first, and then it changes, and the other, then the other one is the root, and then it changes again, and the other one is the root. So the purple blocks there are root blocks, the yellow blocks are child blocks, and the roles of these shards in the hierarchical consensus are changing. And this does not require that we reason about consensus safety at all, because the the correct by construction process kind of guarantees that with no thought, because uh, it's kind of upstream from our definition process. And so relatively little work compared to normally working in consensus protocols, we define this like, actually relatively complex consensus protocol that like, this comes to consensus on you know, the state of two shards with blocks that have like, two different positions and have like, a relatively complicated fork choice rule. Um, and here is like, a, the kind of next con kind of conclusion of that is like, oh, look, when we have two shards that can send messages, we can do routing. If we can move shards around in two positions, we can move shards around in more. And then we have this you know, uh, pretty cool sharding solution where we have messages being routed around uh, across shards and with like, the atomicity property that if your um, route isn't fully completed, then the block that started that route will be orphaned. Um, so we have like, you know, a really kind of strong ability to iterate very quickly uh, because of the correct by construction approach, because we don't need to look back at the previous guarantees, we're not at risk of disrupting them. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'll, I'll narrow, walk through this again. So, so this, so, so what's what's going to happen here is first the the root shard was initially zero, now it's switching to one. These messages are being routed from shards six to three and back. Shards shard zero and one switched from zero one to like one zero and then and then back. And then shard three became a child of shard four, even though it was previously a sibling. And then messages start to get routed through shard four after that swap. So it's really kind of quite complicated. We have like routing tables and they're updating, and, but we really didn't need to think about consensus protocols almost at all while specifying this thing. So, you know, we have, oh, thank you. So we have like a methodology that lets us define consensus protocols. We've defined a large number of consensus protocols, or partially defined a large number of consensus protocols, and um, you know, and we iterate while creating minimal proof obligations, and we are able to mix and match uh, kind of a lot. And you know, so I recommend that you try out, um, you know, correct by construction. And we, um, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong slide here. Got, got ahead of myself. That was the next slide. Um, so, so we basically really rely on these partial specifications. And you know, the fact that it's not defined yet is actually a huge asset for us. The fact that we leave things undefined until you know, the latest possible moment means that we have uh, as much flexibility as possible to iterate without disrupting our previous proofs. So I already said all this. Yes, it's, it's great. Try it. Correct by construction protocol design. It's awesome. So now let's we're moving to the like f kind of announcement section of the talk. Um, so that was that was like all that was pretty much all of the all, all of the content. So we have um, some a bunch of a bunch of announcements of people like you know contributing to uh, CBC Casper Research. This is a uh, Rob Hambrock from True Level built a uh, generative testing for the CBC Casper protocols. Um, so I'm gonna let's see if I can. 
And then what this, ooh, ooh, spoiler alert. Um, so what this, what this kind of shows here is uh, the, the, the red, the red um, dots are members of a clique, which are validators who see each other agree in a way that they um, are, are, are actually finalizing that block, the blue one down there. Um, and this is something you know, related to the way that finality works in, 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 uh, in Casper. Um, and, and, and here we see like multiple views of the protocol uh, from the point of view of four different validators until one of them finds uh, a decision on this block, namely finalizing you know, this, 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 this blue block. And the, the green dots are the messages from the validator whose view we see, and the red dots are the uh, clique which is like a, a, a group of validators who sees each other agree in a certain way that corresponds to a consensus signature that, um, you know, uh, is like a decision. So, um, so that's pretty cool stuff. You know, the, I mentioned the sharding proof of concept. We've been working on this with like a significant, like, rotating group of people since the uh, ETH Berlin hackathon. And actually before that, at the Ethereum IC3 workshop, we worked on the specification. Um, especially want to give a shout out to Alex Skidinoff, who in the last like, you know, week and also during the East San Francisco hackathon put in like, heroic efforts to get the routing working and the shard swapping. I mean, he's the first, he's the first person to prototype the, the cross shard message routing, I'm a bit jealous. Um, but uh, you, know, you should check out this GitHub repo and see if you like it. And it's not, there's still loads of bugs. Um, but there's, you know, it's, it's definitely interesting. Um, Aditya, who is probably somewhere here, has announced that he's implementing a sharding client uh, with, like, you know, Ethereum blocks and, like, you know, very like Ethereum sharding client. And he has a GitHub repo and a Twitter handle. You should follow him for his work. Um, we, this is an exciting one. We kind of released a draft, or are going to release a draft. When I wrote these slides, I thought we'd have it released by now, but we're going to release a draft today of, oh wait, it is released, my bad, github.com slash cbc dash Casper. Um, and you can download a new specification of the minimal CBC Casper protocol states that is, you know, extremely rigorous and pedantic. Uh, with an uh, extremely rigorous and pedantic proof of the consensus safety result and example protocols, including uh, the friendly ghost, the finality gadget, um, a sh sharding with fixed hierarchy. And I'd like to thank the co my co-authors, uh, Nate Rush, Aditya, and uh, uh, Georgios. Uh, and they're all here. Um, you, you, should, you can probably recognize them from their faces. I put, uh, Aditya's face was on the previous slide. Um, finally, you know, don't forget about the prototype and the wiki at Ethereum slash CBC dash Casper. Um, those are like good resources if you want to like dip your toes and check it out. Um, you know, we're totally looking for help of all kinds and we're getting better and better at helping you help us as the like documentation and definitions and stuff have laid themselves out in a way where you can, you know, come in and contribute in a way where it's really clear how it interfaces with everyone else's work and where you, know, you won't be wasting your time and you will be helping. Um, so, you know, um, reach out and thanks so much for listening. Um, I, I have time for one question. It's okay. You don't need to ask a question. I can just go. Bye, everyone. Oh, wait, there's a question. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. Uh, do you have microphones? What's the deal? They're, they're, they're th the microphones are at the front. You have to come up, come up to the front. We got like 30 seconds. You got to be quick. 10 second question, 20 second answer. Yeah, can you hear me? Uh, good. Um, what, what's a good way of uh, really understanding CBC uh, if you come from a math background? Yes, read this paper. The and anything, anything more sort of high level, just... Uh... No, the paper is really good. It's, just okay. set, it's set theory. Okay. It's very accessible, I think. Okay.